Jennifer, as you know, uh, the Trayvon Martin case today had a couple of big developments. Uh, the huge rally in Sanford, Florida tonight that you've been seeing uh, covered on our air here on MSNBC this evening. Also the news that the Sanford, Florida police chief has temporarily stepped down. We will have more on that ahead, and we will keep you updated throughout the hours as the story continues to evolve and as we learn more. Now, last night uh, at the top of the show, we did a report on the Mitt Romney campaign that seems to have jangled some nerves. Uh, this, for example, was the splash page for the Huffington Post today. I don't know exactly what the F stands for there, but it's not good. Uh, I, I knew that we would strike a nerve or two with that report because it is a sensitive subject. Uh, it is hard to talk about, but I think it's important. There is something different about Mitt Romney as a presidential candidate as compared to every other modern major party presidential candidate. There's a certain amount of lying and stretching the truth and spinning history that everybody expects, if not tolerates, at all levels of politics and on both sides of the aisle. But there is something different about the Romney campaign. And this is an assertion by me, and I'm happy to hear it challenged. But I assert, based on what I see to be the facts, that there is something unique about this campaign, and that is the frequency with which the candidate himself has been lying during the campaign. His willingness to lie even about small stuff that doesn't seem to have any political benefit to him, just lying for the sake of lying. But also the candidate and the campaign's lack of compunction, lack of remorse, or even explanation when they get caught lying. They don't correct it when they get called out. They don't seem to feel bad about it. They do not seem to see it as a problem. Case in point. The very first television ad run by Mr. Romney's campaign this year. Uh, last night on the show, we talked about how Mitt Romney's announcement speech, his maiden speech when he launched his campaign, uh, he told a big lie in that speech, uh, in this case, uh, about the economy. But not just in his first speech, but in his first ad, the first TV ad of the Romney campaign, he also told an absolute black and white, no question, full on, blatant lie. Steer ourselves out of this crisis. Then who's been in charge of the economy? We need a rescue plan for the middle class. We need to provide relief for homeowners. It's going to take a new direction. If we keep talking about the economy, we're going to lose. Stop it right there. That was Mitt Romney's first television ad. Makes it sound really bad, right? What President Obama said? Makes it sound awful. President Obama saying right there, you heard him in the ad, if we keep talking about the economy, we're going to lose. It sounds awful. You want to know what President Obama really said? Senator McCain's campaign actually said, and I quote, if we keep talking about the economy, we're going to lose. He was quoting somebody else. He was quoting somebody else critically. And they made it look like that's what President Obama was saying on his own behalf. They made it look like President Obama said something he did not say. That's the equivalent of editing the word don't out of somebody saying, I don't love you, in order for you to prove how beloved you are. You said it. I just took it out of context. That was the first Mitt Romney ad of the campaign. That is what the Romney campaign has been like. And in a political world where there are very low expectations for how truthful political ads are, in a political world where you just assume and therefore excuse a certain level of sliminess and sleight of hand on the part of political professionals, even in a beltway that cynical, what Mr. Romney did in that first ad of his campaign caused legitimate outrage even from a very cynical beltway press. Having been caught red-handed telling this really blatant lie, the Romney campaign then responded with no apology and no correction, signaling from his very first ad, like from his very first speech, that as a presidential candidate, Mr. Romney would be okay with lying, even when he got caught for it. Last night when we broached this topic uh, for the first time, we talked about Mr. Romney lying uh, about the economy, uh, lying about his own political resume, lying about the deficit, lying about the national anthem. Uh, in fact, Steve Bennett, uh, who used to work for Washington Monthly, who now works for the show, Steve has done, I kid you not, a 10-part series. That's volume 10. Uh, a 10-part series so far cataloging things that Mitt Romney has lied about as a presidential candidate this time around. Things he has been called out on for lying and has not corrected. It's not that Steve has documented 10 lies. It's 10 volumes of lies, 10 catalogs of lies so far. 
Mr. Romney is okay with lying as he runs for president, even when he gets caught. And it, it is amazing. I think it is the most notable thing about his candidacy. It is an important thing about his candidacy that we have to grapple with as a country. Whether the sort of thing is just the sort of thing we expect. Whether it's okay for something, somebody running for president or whether it's not okay. Whether it goes to a question of his character and what we expect of people running for an office this high. But here's the further question. Is this not just a character question for Mitt Romney? That he's okay with lying even when he gets caught? Is this instead a standard that he is going to set for his campaign? Is this the way the whole pro-Mitt Romney effort is going to be run? Is Mitt Romney leading by example here? Is he signaling that he expects people who, who support him to behave in this same way and to have these same standards? Well, today we got a test of that, uh, and the results of the test were, even to very cynical people, a little shocking. The Wall Street Journal editorial page, obviously a very conservative editorial page, and, and not just conservative, it is specifically Republican conservative. One of their regular columnists at the Wall Street Journal is the chief political strategist for the last Republican president, a man you may have heard of, named Karl Rove. Uh, Mr. Rove published a column in the Wall Street Journal today in which he criticized President Obama as having no accomplishments to run on in his campaign for re-election. He criticized the Obama campaign's release of a 17-minute video documenting what the campaign sees as Mr. Obama's accomplishments. And then Mr. Rove said this. He said, quote, as for the killing of Osama bin Laden, Mr. Obama did what virtually any commander-in-chief would have done in the same situation. Even President Bill Clinton says in the film, quote, that's the call I would have made. For this to be portrayed as an epic achievement of the first term tells you how bare the White House cupboards are. Greg Sargent at the Washington Post picked up on where this quote actually came from today, and it is amazing. Watch this. It's instructive and chilling. Remember, what Karl Rove says in his column is, even President Bill Clinton says in the film, that's the call I would have made. So no biggie, right? Here's the part of that film that Mr. Rove says he is quoting from. This is the part from which Mr. Rove has extracted that quote. Watch. A lot of people have asked, how did you feel when you first heard that it was Bin Laden and he had been killed? And the truth is, I didn't have time for a lot of feelings at that point because our guys were still in that compound. And it wasn't until I knew that they were across the border, they were safe, everybody was accounted for, including the dog, uh, that uh, you know, I allowed some satisfaction. He took the harder and the more honorable path. When I saw what had happened, I thought to myself, I hope that's the call I would have made. I hope that's the call I would have made. That means something very different than, that's the call I would have made. Does this sort of quoting technique seem familiar to you? Senator McCain's campaign actually said, and I quote, if we keep talking about the economy, we're going to lose. It's going to take a new direction. If we keep talking about the economy, we're going to lose. I think it is important that Mitt Romney lies a lot as a presidential candidate and seems to be okay with the lying. As he becomes the Republican Party's presidential nominee, as he becomes that party's de facto national leader, is his ethical standard on lying going to set the standard on the right? We contacted the Wall Street Journal today to find out if they were going to run a correction on Mr. Rove's lie on behalf of Mr. Romney, in effect, uh, which ran in the Wall Street Journal today. Initially, the Wall Street Journal declined to comment on our request, telling us they would give us no comment on the subject. But later in the day, they did finally correct the quote in the online version of Mr. Rove's article. We also reached out to Mr. Rove today to find out if he agrees that that correction was necessary, uh, if he regrets the error, if he even considers it to have been an error. We have not heard back from Mr. Rove, although we hope to. Carl Rove's uh, super PACs have pledged to spend more than a quarter billion dollars on this year's presidential election. It'll all be on behalf, in essence, uh, of Mr. Romney. Uh, political ads, including Mr. Rove's, have never been a paragon of virtue and honesty in the past. But this year, with this particular potential nominee on the Republican side, who is running this particular kind of a campaign, is one side of the political spectrum giving up on the idea that what you say ought to be true. If this is the Mitt Romney era of Republican politics, what should we know about Mitt Romney, the Republican, to know if we should expect this to get worse in the country in a big and qualitatively new way? Joining us now is the co-author of The Real Romney, Scott Hellman. He's also a staff writer at the Boston Globe. Mr. Hellman, it's great to have you here tonight. Thank you very much for your time. 
My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I don't expect you to share my analysis, and it is clearly my own and not yours. But I wanted to talk to you because Indeed. of your your history of uh, of reporting on Governor Romney over such a long period of his political career. Your research on his political career. Have you seen instances where he has insisted on politically inconvenient honesty, where he has? chastise people for telling lies on his behalf, where he has turned down political advisors who have told him to do something that might be shady, even though it might benefit him. Have, have you seen him do things that we that maybe I'm not seeing at the presidential level? I can't recall any instances like that. I mean, certainly, I, have, I remember this criticism of him coming up when he was governor. There were a couple of cases I can think of. One uh, that you've probably talked about on your show where Massachusetts was part of this regional greenhouse gas initiative, that it was a sort of regional effort to lower greenhouse gas emissions. And I remember being at an energy conference when Mitt Romney was, was defending it and saying that I've had industry leaders come up to me, meaning corporations, saying this is going to hurt our, our, our bottom line because energy costs are going to go up. And I, I assured them that, no, it's only going to be 1% or 2%. And then there was a certain point when that totally changed, and that was not his line, and he really began moving away from it, and he would always get mad at me when I would bring it up and try to ask him about it and say, i got to get you the transcript of that, and I would tell him that I was there, and you were defending it, and now you're slamming it, saying it's going to, uh, you know, lead to higher energy costs. And then there was another one where uh, the head of a transportation commission in Massachusetts, the, one of those blue ribbon panels that looked at how do we pay for our roads and bridges, came up with this recommendation that we needed to basically have billions of new revenue. And, uh, you know, the head of that, that commission at one point said that, uh, you know, once they presented it to Mitt Romney, he did not want to hear that at all. He did not want to hear billions of new revenue. And he sort of looked at him and said, we're done with that. We put our own plan out. You know, it's not going forward. And the guy said it, it was like... It was a bright, sunny day, and he was telling me it was black outside. So this is something that we have seen in his, in his political career, certainly, before. It, on, specifically on the issue of energy, I did a lot of reading today, it, thanks in part to a New Republic piece um, about his positions as governor on energy issues and the contrast with some of the positions he's taking now as a presidential candidate. He, as governor, for example, rejected a proposal that Massachusetts should get rid of or suspend its gas, state gas tax as a way of bringing gas prices down. He said, I don't think this is a time when you want to be encouraging people to use less gasoline. That would be a bad idea. He also directly raised uh, prices at the pump by raising gas taxes on Massachusetts consumers initially as part of a fund that would clean up underground gas tank spills at gas stations. Eventually, he got rid of that purpose for the fund and just applied it to the general, uh, general coffers. All of that kind of stuff is totally contrary, totally opposite to what he is attacking President Obama for on gas prices right now. Is that a case of sort of selective amnesia? He doesn't remember that he's done that? Or do you think it's, he's just sort of hoping that people won't bring that up in his record? Or is it the kind of thing where he acknowledges that he has changed over time? I mean, look, at heart, Mitt Romney is a pragmatist. As, as we know, he looks at every campaign and every situation and figures out what he has to do to succeed in that environment. And when he was in Massachusetts, you know, that was a very different, there was a very different calculus there. And I think, I mean, you go back further, even further than that, in his gubernatorial campaign, he was calling for, at one point, he was calling for uh, an SUV tax, sort of surtax, excise tax on SUVs because they use more gasoline. I mean, that kind of thing is very difficult to imagine him saying today. Um, so, you know, I think to the extent that he has an ideology, it is, it is pragmatism. I think that really is who he is at, at heart. And... I mean, when you ask him about it, he says, uh, look, you know, I wrote this book, no apology, all my views are, are, in, are in there. Um, the, but the fact is, you're right, he has changed on a number of things, well beyond the abortion stuff that gets so much attention. And this started, of course, not just in this campaign, but back in 2005, 2006, when he was starting to run for president last time. So we've seen this very gradual evolution. Ironically, Rachel, I think, in this campaign, he's tried almost, at least initially, tried to tack back to the middle and run as the Mr. Fix-It economic guy. And he's been forced now to defend his right because here we are in almost April still talking about Rick Santorum. Scott Hellman, the co-author of The Real Romney, staff writer at the Boston Globe. Thanks very much for talking to us about this. I realize you're covering him uh, in an ongoing way, and I might not be the most convenient person to talk to as this stuff goes on, but your perspective on this is really helpful to me. So thanks for, thanks for joining us. My pleasure.